Welcome to the October 6, 2020 Tri-Community Land Bank Acquisition and Dispositions Committee meeting. Thank God yes. for you. Okay, okay, Brian, thanks for calling the meeting, meeting to order at 336. Go ahead. All right, we have uh, the last set of meeting minutes in front of us from April 7th. We have a motion to approve those minutes. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Jeanette. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, on to purchase applications. Tony. Uh, this one would be much better if Kate walked us through it. Um, she, okay. She's uh, redlined it and she's gone back and forth with uh, the the other attorneys. Okay. Okay, you okay uh, with that? Yeah, which one are we? Oh, I'm sorry, purchase applications. There are no purchase applications in right now. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> I'm, Brian, were you on the purchase option agreement? I'm looking, hold on a minute. I just uh, bring up another version of the agenda here. Yeah, I may be looking at the I have two meeting invites and they have different um, documents inside them. On that. Yeah, I tried to make life yeah. easy and I might might have made it more complicated. Yeah, no, that's fine. I'm just getting them both in front of me. Yeah, it says purchase applications thirty three twenty five. 6th Ave and 24 McClellan Avenue. Am I looking at the correct agenda? Yeah, the, well, there actually are no purchase applications. There are, there's a purchase option agreement. This must, this is an old um, agenda, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't say October, so let me, uh, oh, where are we? Yeah. All right, so the one I'm looking at is okay. Um, the purchase option agreements that were sent over for 806, 810, 812, 879, 881 River Street, along with 102 West Glen, um, the, those are the final versions that Jeremy Root, uh, Beacon's attorney, and I um, agreed upon uh, for the option to purchase um, those properties. The other agreement really wasn't necessarily something you need to approve, but rather um, is the Vesta mirror agreement with them to acquire the other properties. And um, the way that we think the transaction will work is we probably won't acquire the Vesta parcels until right before we flip them to Beacon. It's sort of, it would be like a back-to-back -back closing. Um, and they have until December, 2021 to close and to get this project going. And the reason for that is they're applying for um, tax credits from the state of New York. So they have to qualify for that. Um, in connection with it, I also sent over after talking to Tony today to their attorney, another um, proposed maintenance agreement, because as you may remember, if we were going to hold these properties in an option for um, a period until December 2021, conceivably, we wanted to have our costs covered. So I sent that over there today. Um, the amount is somewhere around eight to nine thousand dollars for just about fourteen months of expenses for these particular properties, and so that would have to be executed in connection with these two options, you know, to move forward with it. So really, um, what's before you today is just to propose that these option agreements get on the agenda for the full board meeting so that we can approve those and move forward. 
when you say maintenance agreements, um, Kate, I'm assuming that's like snow removal and lawn mowing. Does it include anything else or just the, that basic function? It includes insurance too for uh -huh. maintaining those. And we would still do the maintenance, you know, trip, however we do it, you know, they're, they're going to okay. continue to do it. We would just be reimbursed for the cost. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So we need a motion to recommend this to the board for approval. Yes. Exactly. Okay. So I'll make a motion to uh, to uh, approve the approve this for uh, board approval. Thanks, Jeanette. I second the motion. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, we so, so, okay, you said we don't need to get into 809, 814, et cetera, right? Right, because those are the VESTA parcels, correct? Yeah. I think, yeah. And so, so VESTA currently owns those. And the way it's just set up is that, like I said, um, we would purchase from Vesta, hopefully right before we would flip to Beacon. And that way there's no real issue, you know, with us holding that property for any length of time. Okay. All right. So jump down to demolition RFP. Yeah, for some reason I don't have that agenda. That's, I, I sent uh, that like today. She, yeah. Um, okay, let me, uh, no. let me pull it up. So a spreadsheet, right, Tony? Yeah. Okay. And that should be, are you seeing the spreadsheet? Yes, well, okay. yes. Okay. So this uh, this RFP was due two o'clock yesterday, and this is an RFP. This was an RFP for the demolition of Seven Park Avenue. Um, we received three bids. I should tell you th these are all really good prices. Um, we had uh, based on uh, a consultant oh, doing yeah. an estimate for the demolition, we had budgeted sixty thousand dollars for the demo. The low bid came in at. Uh, twenty-seven thousand eight hundred ninety dollars, which is a really good price. <laughs> Great, yeah. Um, and I looked over everyone's paperwork for what was required to be turned in for the RFP, and I didn't see anything in this with any of the bidders. Does that include any hazmat? Yes, it includes all hazmat. Okay, great. Um, let me see here. This is like a two-story wood structure. Yeah, it's small. It's a small structure. Yeah. Just so. It, oh, I'm sorry. Does it include taking the foundation out of the ground? It does not include that. Okay. What happens to that then, Tony? Well, I, I, they don't take it out of the ground. They just knock knock it in the hole. Uh huh. And then fill it. Um. Okay. If that's something, if that's something that um, you know A and D would like to see happen, I could try to get a price for that. No, I, I was just curious because I'm thinking if you know somebody's going to go ahead and develop that, um, I'm not sure how that works. If they're going to have to put in a new foundation, do they then have to remove what's been filled in and then start? Or technically, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. They'd have to remove all the uncontrolled fill. Okay. Um, uh, the just by way of um, comment, I have seen um, the Albany Land Bank do work with Christo and WPNT. They're both uh, do a lot of demos for Albany, so it's good to see them on there. Great. Um, and you know they've been pretty good contractors. I, I haven't heard of any issues with it. So um, 
so in this case, you know, uh, Krista would be the um, lowest responsible bidder. Yep. And I think WPNT, I think it's Larry Toon, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah. These, uh, these bidders all came from Russ Reeves, who um, he's involved in a lot of the demolitions at, at the city of Albany. Not necessarily yep. for the land bank, but for the city itself. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm okay with it. It's just, I, I think if you're going to develop multiple units on that lot, you're just, you're, you're sort of kicking the can a little down the road a little bit, but that's a, I think that's probably okay. I think it's a similar cost regardless. There's no need to pay for it now. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, yeah, there'll be a, a little extra excavation to pull out what gets thrown in the hole. Ah, uh, okay. Right. Yep. Which may not a big, be a big deal um, if you have a basement. But if you don't have a basement, you got to put back structural fill in its yeah. place. So. But I, I, I'm okay either way. That's fine. Because it may be a long time before something happens there. So. Yeah, that's true. We don't know what the timetable will be. So yeah, so this is part of the uh, parcel assemblage that um, Habitat may do something on in conjunction with the uh, RPI app right. uh, partnership. Um, and I think it'd be good if they um, we know for a fact they're not gonna like if there were has if there was hazmat in the basement associated with these walls that they're just gonna knock bury under the ground. It'd be good to know that they're not burying any hazmat. Ah, gotcha. Okay, I'll have to uh, talk to Christo and see. Uh, that's a situation I've never had to run uh, run through. So, what is? Well, um, well, the the bid says that the contractor is responsible for remediating all asbestos. Um. So, yeah. you know, I I think that's all asbestos. Yeah. But it, it would be good. It would be good to be clear. <laughs> Yeah, well, it'd be good to be really clear before they do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think that's clear as it is, but no. You might I, have I'm to have sure. an asbestos um, inspection prior to, right? So, yeah, that's uh, the way I worded the RFP is that the contractor is responsible for um, all uh, asbestos re remediation actions and and uh then i cited i don't know what regulation i cited that they had to follow but it was the same one that syracuse uses i i uh use syracuse's uh demo as a boilerplate mm. so is are they responsible to do a survey or did we already do a survey of the uh no they are responsible to do the survey okay and and the remediation Okay, so that's good. So once you see the survey, you'll know if you got anything in the basement. And then if they do have anything in the basement, they gotta make sure it's out before they collapse the, and bury it. Yeah. Yep. I, I think it'll be important to be very clear about that before they jump in. Yep. So um, I'm good. Anyone else have any questions about it? No, I just think we need a, a motion to put it on the agenda to award the bid to Christo. Before uh, this business gets clarified, Kate, or? Well, what's the clarification, I guess? Well, the business of Brian was just uh, the issue that he raised, whether or not, or did you give up, uh, not give up, but is this now? No, I, I I, I'm satisfied that it's included in their price and that it will be confirmed 
the scope will be confirmed upon the survey that they have to perform. So. Okay. okay. Then I, so I'll I make a motion to approve the, the proposal for the demolition of Seven Parker, at least to recommend the proposal to the board. <clears throat> I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Hey, Christina. So, where are we on the agenda? Is Christina in the meeting? Yes, uh, she joined a little bit late, yeah. but she's there. Okay. Great. So, so we have two two non-committee board members, Pat Riley on, and uh, Christina and Maribel. Uh, next on the agenda, deep covenant requirements. Yeah, so this is um, in my monthly um, check-in call with Tanya from Enterprise. Um, she wanted to know if what the, well, not what the income was, but she wanted to know that um, the tenants at 3325 Sixth Avenue would be, um, their, that their incomes would be 100% um, or less uh, area median income. Um, so that took me a little bit by surprise because I thought that in previous funding rounds, the the 100% um, AMI requirement was that 80% of all the units that we sell to people have to be 100% AMI or less. When I looked into the agreement, I, I do believe they changed it from round three to the current round, round four because it says 80% um, of all units in grantees projects, um, residents must have incomes of at 100% AMI or below. And when I read through the document, they seem to, and there's no, no clear definition, but when they see the grantees project, I think they're talking about individual projects, not, you know, the, total sum of all of our projects. So uh, Kate and I spoke about that. And I think the remedy is that it would have to be um, a covenant in the deed when we sell property. That's correct. Um, and, you know, I think as we talk today about our whole application and closing process, and it really needs to be tightened up for this reason, because my office is only as good as knowing, you know, what details come with the property that we're closing on. And this would certainly be one of them. In addition to that, you know, as this committee plans the sales and, and, the, and the dispositions and even the acquisitions, we have to be, uh, you know, when we look at applications, cognizant of what the enterprise requirements are. And so that may very well be that uh, certain purchasers uh, may not necessarily qualify to meet this restriction. And I think for a rental, if I recall correctly, it's the same, like if you're gonna rehab and rent, your, your um, uh, tenants must meet those income requirements. Now, this all being said, I don't think even the market rate in Troy at this point is 100% of the A. I mean, it could be very close anyway, so it's not a big deal, but, what this does, and I was not a big fan of it when it first came out, um, and it used to be 80% of the AMI going back to 2015, but I wasn't a big fan because what that does is we've got to track the income of the buyers for 10 years. We might not even be here in 10 years, right? <laughs> so, and I don't say that, you know, um, that we won't, but, you know, I mean, with state funding and the way things have been going, you just don't know. So what that really requires us to do is to track the income for 
10 years. And then that to me is, is quite a burden on the land banks, but. You know, what's another oddity, uh, Kate, is um, when we got approval for round 4.2, part of it was a requirement to track the incomes of um, all residents of the units we sell property to. Um, but they said you can't force them to give you the information, um, but you but you can request it. So when you put you know when you put this covenant requirement together and what they said uh, about tracking, it doesn't seem you know they just don't seem to dovetail. Right, and I mean I guess I would think you know are we adding a question to the application then? Um, to disclose the annual income of the persons to be living in the house? And if so, you know, okay, but as we attach the application to the enforcement note and or, um, you know, otherwise have to disclose the applications pursuant to FOIL, we would have to redact that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. Um, so and and what and what is the the requirement the AMI requirement again? Um, eighty percent of each project um, must have tenants there whose incomes are less than one hundred percent of area median income. Right. So eighty percent of the properties we sell, they want the person who lives there to have income less than 100% of the AMI. And we'll probably, Tony, there's a website, if you Google it, we can find out what Troy's uh, AMI is. What's the website? I don't know, you have to Google it. It's out there, I've seen it before. Yeah. I don't know the address in particular. And it changes. Uh, is, it, is, this a, is this a mandatory thing or is this just something open for discussion? No, this is a mandatory uh, requirement of our funding. And then what is optional, I think, is what Tony is saying is we can't make people give us their income information, but if they opt in, Enterprise would like us to attempt to collect it. That, that just seems so onerous. Yeah, yeah. Well, it I, is. you know, so actually for tenants, I mean, I, I understand the owner of the building. I, you know, I, I don't really have a problem with that, but to try and force the tenants to annually well, I, I don't know. It just seems well. Possible. Here's the here's the real problem with it, and I was I went over this with the Albany Land Bank, you know. And again, there's not much we can do, but Jeez. for for basic transactions, just you know, we're flipping a piece of property with a deed and an enforcement note. We would have to, if Enterprise had money into the project, we would have to put a restriction in the deed that requires the person living there to meet these income requirements. If for some reason, um, let's say within the first five years, they wanna flip the property, right? Cause we allow them to with our permission, that next person would still have to meet those income requirements because it runs, the redeed restriction runs with the land, right? So, um, and then even, wow. Like to to add to that, what really happens, like we did some neighbors for neighbors grants and um, there's income rec income requirements for, um, and also with that grant, you had to own it for 10 years. But basically it, it requires me to put another land covenant, entirely separate document. Um, along with the deed in the enforcement note that says <clears throat> that it's income restricted and the person has to disclose and, you know, it's a whole other document that governs, you know, the purchase of the property. Albany Land Bank was successful in selling at least two of them that I know of to investors who were going to rent and we worked through, you know, what the restrictions were. And, you know, they were happy to oblige, but, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of folks looking at applying and said, no way, I'm not going to buy a restricted property like this. And 
sometimes when you do a rehab, you want to rent it at market rate and maybe, you know, yeah. you wouldn't be able to do that. So that's all the legal yeah. problems with it. But I mean, it's doable, but it is, it's, it's cumbersome. It, it seems also like a kind of a odd breed of redlining to me to say, you know, cause we have a target area. I mean, we're, we're out, everything we're doing is operating at a target area and, and you're saying, you know, this area is only going to have such and such an income. Right. It's crazy. Well, right. Because the whole idea is hopefully to build the income and, 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 and fill like diversity in the neighborhood. Right. So um, you don't have the gentrification <laughs> problems or whatnot, but what it, it does, it's almost like a reverse, you know, it's going to keep low income folks there. In, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. 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 The opposite effect of what we want. <laughs> right. In a way. I mean, that being said, and again, when we look at the AMI in Troy, it may very well be that it's fairly high. I know in Albany, it's fairly high. It's I have it here. I have it here now. It's the average income of a Troy resident is 21635 a year. The median household income of a Troy resident is 39526 Yeah, that, Whoa. That's, not okay. area, that's definitely not area median income, though, Greg. It's much yeah, I, don't think, I thought it was around 79000 actually, for a single person. 80% of that, AMI. That, I'm looking at something. I'm not 100% confident of what I'm looking at, but 80% of uh, AMI is 79360 yeah, right. 100% is 99200 And that's, think, the, that's the regional AMI. This is Troy. I just, I just put in Troy, New York, area median income. But I don't think that's what, what typically is used it's somehow the, or another. It's the regional AMI. Yeah. The 79,000 rings a bell. And it's yeah. household, right? Pretty low. Yeah, that 80,000 number has been sticking in my head and that 79 is close to it. Yeah. So you would have to have, that's why I said, I think it's pre, it's higher than you would think. Okay. Um, yeah, but, I think you that. But what Greg is saying is his point is well taken is look at the difference like Troy would be really low, right? Look at how right. low it is. So, you know, conceivably you could make the argument that um, even people who have bought from us already would probably fit in that 80,000 and under. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, you know, to try to find folks who would be not only credit worthy, but financially ready to purchase something with under $30,000 of income, the bank could never go for it, you know? So, um, well, the, the North Central Census Tract is probably one of the most like impoverished census tracts, like I think in the state. It's yeah. really, it's way down there. Um, yeah. And, you know, good luck trying to sell our new building to someone with, with the, with the average AMI, even for the region. Um, yeah. Well, one of the things, so, the, the sticking point that I'm, I still am not clear about, but as I read the round four agreement, it seems to me that it's saying, um, and, and I said this before, maybe I didn't say it clearly. It seems to me that it's saying every single property we sell, um, you know, the AM, 80% of the people that live there have to have AMIs of 100% or less. And if that's the case, we have a big problem. Um, what, what our understanding was for rounds three and two was that 80% of all the units we sell property to, not individually, but all of them collectively, that 80% of, of those had to be 100% AMI or less. So right. when you're looking at that group, it's not nearly, not nearly as big a problem. But when you're right. looking at it project by project, then it, it, it definitely can create problems. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think, I think it actually, it works well, um, the regional AMI over the, the actual district's AMI is, is probably a good thing. And it probably work for a lot of like, say what Habitat would do. Um, but I don't think it works for the building that we're constructing right now. 
uh, it, doubtful. Be doubtful. How could it? Well, you know what? That's actually a round three. That's funded with round round three funds, not round four. Well, the okay. way the way it would work is if somebody bought it, and Tony, I just made a note to look at both agreements again to make sure we get this right. Um, is whoever bought it would have to agree to a deed covenant, and this is what I was saying, to rent to 80% of the AMI. And the problem with that legally, forget about like, it just, does it, is it common sense? But the problem with it legally is, you know, let's say you can't rent it to some, you know what I mean? Like you just can't find somebody that's gonna rent it for that or whatever. You're in breach of that covenant immediately. Yeah. Right. So legally speaking, it creates a mess. So <laughs> let's do this. Let me look at both round three and round four again in the requirements and get some clarification. Um, because in Albany, yes, we've put covenants on and we've used some deed restrictive language, but they were, they were projects where we knew the buyer already met the requirement. Right. So no big deal. And they agreed to it. So, you know, I think 791 River is a wild card right now. We have to figure out what to do with that. And then going forward, what the plan is. And, you know, maybe you tag certain properties with the thought that, you know, hopefully we could meet that requirement on these versus others. So um, we'll have to look at that again. But, um, you know, Tanya brought it up. So I think Tony was like, okay, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> Yes. Mm. Okay. So is there any action needed? No, I just wanted to bring bring it up for discussion so everyone was aware that it, it's a potential problem. Mm. Okay. What we'll do is we'll put it on the agenda for next month and hopefully I'll have some answers and some thoughts. You know. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so agenda item nine. Uh, property application, yeah. policy. Kate, yep. that's your, your baby. Yes. So um, because we've started selling more properties, um, and as we begin to talk about enforcement on a lot of these, um, I wanted to go back and review the process for sales and, and come up with, um, you know, the right policies, procedures, and draft of the application so that we're all on the same page going forward because it is beginning to create legal issues um, as we move forward in the sale process. Not, not only sometimes from the get-go, but in the enforcement piece because we'll get to closing and people will say, I had no idea about the enforcement mortgage. So um, because of COVID, I think Tony and I were going to work on this you know, the beginning of this year, once Paris was done and get it squared away, but then, you know, COVID hit. So here we are. So if you, if you look at the application um, that you're using, I did add um, some pages to it. And what it does is specifically add, and I, I revised the um, purchaser certification because that had to be tightened up a little bit. And if you note know, in paragraph four, I think it is on yours, um, I added in what, and again, you don't have to, but it's a suggestion. What Albany County Land Bank calls an asset management fee, and it's 3% of the purchase price. And what that does is it gets the land bank uh, more funds to support staff budget while you are monitoring the property, while they are, um, Tony, got to take that down. Um, oh, attorney client privilege, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you. So while, while they are, you certainly can put the application up. Um, so while they're working on the project, Tony has to monitor, we have to get reports from them. So what it does is it just covers, you know, our extra work we have to do until we can 
discharge that enforcement mortgage. Um, Albany it instituted it against all its properties. Um, some people were ticked, some people didn't care. Um, it's just one of those things. But seeing as you're struggling for funds, I think it would be advisable. And when I tell you what the process and the procedure is going to be, you can understand why you might want to increase that. Um, so that was a change to that page. And then um, there was additional uh, terms and conditions. And I also added an enforcement policy page. Um, hopefully you have that in front of you. And that really outlines how we are going, to, what our policy is. And if you recall, that was adopted back in August, 2019. And the inspections and everything that's gonna be required should you purchase a property from the land bank. And if you notice, there's a signature line on that page as well, um, because I want the people who apply for these properties to sign off that they read it and they understand it. Yeah. And the reason yeah. for, for that is Makes because sense. we will get to closing and everybody has a flip and fit that one, a mortgage and enforcement is going on there to begin with. Two, that there will be a lien against the property until they complete the work. And three, they really just don't want to fill out our stinking reports, right? So um, we can't have that for a lot of reasons. So I'm putting the policy right in the purchase application and I'm making them sign off on it. Um, now, along with all of this is, and if you notice, it says enforcement process and it kind of gives a timeline for reports. And I know Tony developed an actual um, uh, sort of a, a report format on a form so that it could help make it easy for some of these people, at least early on, that, you know, we're just collecting this basic information. But one of the things that, and it's challenging, I don't think any land bank really did well with it at first, um, is enforcement and keeping <clears throat> track of um, you know, the properties that are out there and people being work, doing the work on them and not having it expire. And then a year goes by and we say, oh, how come this hasn't fit, been finished, right? So um, that will now be in the application. And, um, you know, I think we might even, it might even behoove us to attach as an appendix one of, or the reports that they're going to have to submit so they can see the kind of stuff we're asking for. Because I always find disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. And if you want to tell me that, you know, you didn't know, you know, I'm going to ask you, is that your signature on page six of the application? Oh, so you did know. And by the way, it's also on the website. And by the way, it's also in my initial letter when you try to buy a property. And by the way, <laughs> you know, so it's just going to make um, my life easier and also Tony's for the enforcement project. Um, so those are my proposed changes, at least in this go around to the application. I know Tony wanted to, you know, tweak some other things that were more um, land bank related, not so much legal related, uh, which we can revisit too at a different meeting. But I think it's imperative we get these adopted at this monthly meeting so that we can kind of shut down some of the problems and complaints we've had about disclosing the process. Yeah, yeah that, always, I think it's great. I can always come back with my changes later. Um, right, so then the next step becomes, um, and, in, and in looking at the properties, this kind of bleeds in a little bit to the enforcement part of the agenda, but, you know, in looking at the properties were, were um, looking to enforce our enforcement notes against, you know, one of the things is you can see from this schedule, it goes out at least a year. Um, and in some instances, if the project is 18 months, um, you know, it could go out longer is, you know, we really need to be keeping a spreadsheet and, you know, make sure that there's follow up and the reports are coming back and that you know, Tony is allowed to go out and do an inspection and so on and so forth. So, you know, 
I, I kind of have two suggestions and, you know, I don't want to open a huge can of worms, but I think you should discuss it and that this is time consuming and that Tony does not, he's already, you know, strapped for time and completing everything that he needs to, you know, does the question become, does trip maybe take over some of this process? Um, you know, or, you know, does my office run a spreadsheet and ding Tony to do X, Y, and Z when he has to and make sure it gets done? Um, you know, and at some point, if they're not responding to Tony and more than a half our properties have been an enforcement problem, to be honest with you, you know, my letters have to go out as well. So I think Tony needs assistance, if not a complete outsource of this particular, and this is just my opinion, Tony's probably like, she didn't even mention that to me, because I didn't. Um, but, you know, just, just think about it, because part of the reason why we're scrambling a little bit is that we just have not had the time to carry out the enforcement. And Kate, the, uh, the way I created that, um, that progress report, uh, was in large part intentionally for um, people we sell property to to self-report on a regular basis um, and also you know to, to have everyone report on the same with the same consistent information so what I was planning on doing was uh, essentially periodically auditing by physically inspecting the properties um, but um, otherwise you know the report um, the report is probably going to be pretty accurate than what they report back. We also have um, trip maintenance on the ground who can tell us, you know, from what they can see if they see something amiss. And also, um, we actually were starting to use SEAT to do some inspections and then COVID hit. So, um, you know, if we, if we do want to do more inspections than what I was intending, we can do that um, and seats already uh, kind of set up for that. Um, so I, I, I think, think we, we can would... put a, a better, you know, what we have for enforcement now is better than what we had two years ago, but it's not, it's still not good enough. So uh, um, I think we can make some changes to make it uh, a better operation. I, I would certainly uh, think that we would want to inspect all the properties that are uh, active, for sure. Um, and it seems to me that if SEAT is willing to do it, um, why don't we enlarge the function or whatever it takes to, to get you some help, Tony? It just seems, seems crazy. It's just like, um, you know, with the um, information, uh, well, uh, I don't want to carry on here, but um, some additional help from SEAT, if they're already willing to do it, um, you know, let's, let's see if we can work out some arrangement that's equitable. Um, yeah, no, we, we can definitely do that. If, if A&D wants an inspection on a monthly basis or a quarterly basis, well, at least uh, quarterly, I would think. But, uh, hey. well, well, I mean, it, it, it'll, it'll be whatever A&D wants it to be. So, um, well, whatever, you know, whatever your pleasure is. It's um, actually, it's actually not what you want it to be, but what's in your policy. So, if you look at the enforcement policy, um, the property closes and within 30 days, and there's reasons for this, because you have to keep these projects on track. Within 30 days, the buyers have to start the project and submit copies of permits, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, get their insurance bound, show us they're moving forward. 90 days, we need an in-person inspection so that we can see the project has started. One of the, the biggest, um, I'd say 60% of the time, and I've closed, you know, over 500 properties for Albany over the years, 60% of the time is because they didn't start right away, right? And they just never got going. So now out of the gate, your project is 120 days late starting, 
Okay, so you can't have that. Then after the 120 day, or excuse me, the 90 day inspection, there's a follow up at 120 days, maybe a written report like Tony's asking. And then there's another inspection at 210 days because you need to see progress and that this is going to happen within a year. And then there's another 300 day check in and or inspection. So you know, this is the proper way to really do it. And I don't know if you recall, but the Syracuse Land Bank got dinged on their enforcement. Yeah, right. And, you know, the, we, Albany and I'm, myself and, and others came up with kind of this timeline to really uh, show that we had oversight and to make sure that these projects got done. You know, when, if someone isn't responding at, you know, 30 days or 90 days, that's when we have to say, hi, you don't want to respond? Great. Guess what? We're asking for a deed in lieu and we're going to move on this. You know, you don't want to take a property back a year after the deadline has lapsed and <laughs> the work is 30% done and, you know, it just creates a mess. So your schedule is laid out in your purchase application and I think seat would be great to carry it out and I certainly could you know, sit with them and Tony and say, here's exactly what we need you to do. Yeah. We need you if to you have a time the progress yeah. and provide reports. Yeah. If, if there's already a timeline there, um, I, I just say, let's, let's have seat, give Tony a hand and, and do the inspections. I agree. All right, so those are my changes to the application. We just, you know, if you're okay with it, we just want to move it forward to the board agenda and have them adopt it this month. I, I can make a motion to recommend to the board. And I'll second. All, All in favor. favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, enforcement. So, um, title is in on 836 and 785, so I'm going to start to take a look at uh, bringing the action on that one. We just got title, I think, late last week, if I remember correctly. Um, title is in on 822 River, and I know that Tony's had some discussions with uh, Mrs. Razakowski. Um, what I, where I think we're at now is we've asked for certain things and she has a deadline to get it to us uh, by the board meeting or before this month's board meeting would be good. Um, if she doesn't, I think we're at a crossroads where, you know, uh, we need to start the action to take this back because they're just not taking our request seriously. Because what we hope she does is submit a plan that you would approve and we would extend the enforcement note and file the modification and then she would be held to that. Um, and then we would have this inspections and all this stuff and she's going to have to move to completion, you know, within that six months that, you know, it's been extended um, or else she's going to have to give the property back. So you know, um, it's really neither here nor there how far along or how much money has been invested in a property. The enforcement note is designed precisely to have that be a penalty if you don't do what you're supposed to be doing. And all you really have to do is talk to us and she just has not. So we gave her a deadline and if we don't receive a proposal for you to at least consider then we're going to have to commence an action and that's going to be that. Well, that's the status of 822 River. I don't know if there's any further discussion on that you want to have. Um, I, I believe I have asked for the information to be returned uh, by um, the 14th. Okay which is a week before the uh, board meeting. All right, so that was just an enforcement report. There's really no action needed there. Okay. Um, projects and properties updates. 
Uh, let's see. Seat is uh, busy at work at 54 Fifth Avenue. Um, they're working on stabilization down in the basement. Um, and they're um, replacing the main stairs in the front and the stairs going down to the cellar in the back. Um, um, and that's, no, that's the general nature of what they're doing right now. Um, Johnny Bobo has 11 Winnie Ave and 3229 6th Avenue. <clears throat> um, we've been waiting for um, Russ Reeves to provide updated stabilization specs to send to code enforcement. Um, I believe he may have done that for 11 Winnie. If, he, if not, then he's pretty close to doing that. Uh, Johnny Bobo has, I have to give him credit, he has moved work as far forward as you possibly can. He's got 11 Winnie already uh, sheetrocked and probably by now taped on him. Um, so the game plan was to do both of those properties in parallel. Now the game plan is for him to just complete 11 Winnie and then uh, when that's done, he'll jump over to 3229 6th Avenue because of the weather we're starting to run into. It's better to get uh, 11 Winnie, you know, all tightened up and ready to go. Um, so the last time I was in the building was about two weeks ago and um, maybe three weeks ago now. And I saw um, the sheet rock up. Uh, 791 River Street. I, I think um, I sent around good news with my last property uh, update report. They went from doing nothing to suddenly everybody is on full speed ahead. I mean, I just can't believe the difference. I would say virtually the entire interior um, at this point is, is very near completion. Um, the storefront is uh, largely in place, which uh, anybody who's driven by can see that. So yeah. the last of it, um, and I'm not quite sure where they are on, on this. Um, in the interior, the HVAC system needs to be installed. And on the exterior, the metal panels need to be installed. And there's a, a punch list of items that uh, Beth Steckley and I uh, drafted. And, you know, it's not necessarily the type of, of punch list where the GC thinks the property is complete and the owner goes around and says, well, you know, you've got this, this and that and the other thing. Um, the, this punch list is, is more a, work, a workmanship, um, a punch list of work, workmanship items that really need to be addressed. So um, we've got them on record on paper and uh, the GC has not hesitated and, and says he will take care of it all. So we will see. Tony, is there any um, site work that? There's um, four parking spaces in the rear, um, a fence um, at least along the north side, you know, behind the building. I, I don't remember if it turns to run along the alley. They're going to replace um, some parts of the sidewalk. And um, there are some, I don't know if this is in the RFP or not, I can't remember. Um, but even if it's not, there are some trees there that are not looking very healthy because of the work that's going on there. So um, yeah. I made Those are the parking areas paved. Uh, the parking area will be paved for four spaces. Because the asphalt plant shut down around November, right? Well, yeah, it's November. always weather dependent. Well, so. there's no asphalt available after a certain point. So. Yeah, but it's always, I mean, unless you know different than, than I, Brian, it, it's always been a, you know, when it gets cold enough, we're just going to close. It's never been, I've never seen it be a standard date. Yeah. But you're, you're right, it's, it, because of the weather, it's usually sometime in November. Yeah. We, we can get an early snap and- it, 
it can be fall until the, the middle of December sometimes. But the site works on their schedule right now? Yes. For this, for this fall? Well, it's been on their schedule since. <laughs> well, I know it's been on their schedule a long time, but I mean, whatever amended schedule they, they're telling us. Uh, you know what, let me... Because you can't me. sell it until that's all done. Oh, know. You know, no, I know, I know. Well, you yeah. know, and then, if you can't yeah, ask for it, they concrete. If, if they finish it before the winter, at least you can potentially sell it, you know, over the winter. If they don't finish it over the winter, you're kind of dead in the water for another Agreed. four months. Yeah. Uh, and that's not a place we want to be because um, the building loan turns into a mortgage at some point in time. We don't want that. Yeah. Well, um, let me check with him, Brian, just so we are absolutely clear. Yeah, because the, the concrete and the asphalt are going to be weather dependent and really should be done. And it, I don't think there's any reason why. It, and, and what's left on the HVAC? They haven't installed the furnace just, yet? Or? Yeah, they, ex exactly. They just haven't installed the, uh, you know, the main equipment. Yeah. So did, were we, did we get the grant for the HVAC stuff? Um, I, <laughs> I had gotten word back that most of our application appeared to be eligible, um, but that the HVAC systems were not because people were not living in the units. And then I read the regulations and I, I don't think the city of Troy was reading the regulations correctly so I replied back and I said, you know, here's how I read those regulations. Um, I do know that the city was, you know, they were, they had some anxiety about these grants because if it turns out they give money to someone who's not eligible, I think it's the city that has to pay it back. Um, so um, I haven't, that was about two weeks ago, I'd say, and I haven't heard back uh, from yeah. anyone. Last I knew, um, you know, uh, the, the, the decisions were going to be made like two weeks ago. Yeah, the decision, I, I was told the decisions were going to be made the Friday after our last board meeting. And what I received was not a decision, but an email. Um, it certainly wasn't a grand award, which is what I was kind of expecting but more of an, uh, an email update. So that is that is not what I was expecting to get, but that's what I got. Hmm. What, you know, what I heard was decisions will be made the Friday after the last board meeting, um, whenever that was. And um, it, it, you know, it, that's not what I got. Well, whether or not we get that grant does not affect the installation of the HVAC, correct? Well, it kind of does because uh, if, oh. if, if we're <laughs> eligible um, to, you know, make those systems um, COVID combative, whatever it is, probably better word for that, um, then we should be installing it. We're at the point now where the HVAC stuff has to go in and we don't know about the grant. So what do you do? I doubt the city is going to reimburse us if we just put it in without having approval in advance. Um, so, you know, it's, well, I won't say what I was going to say, but it, it's, uh, it's taken a long time to get a decision. And uh, the GC asked me what to do. And I said, you know, at this point, if you've run out of time and you need to install those systems, then install them based on what you spec your spec to install. Which I, I really hate to say, we can always go back and retrofit it, but that that's kind of dumb. But I think that's where we're at. That's not kind of dumb, that's very dumb. Bummer. Ah.
Anything else, Tony? Uh, good news on 3319 6th Avenue. Um, the last report I got from Steve Pierce with Media Alliance is that uh, I believe he said that they should be completing uh, by the end of this month. So um, actually a uh, marketing committee met last night and I'm trying to arrange a, a walkthrough of the building um, at the committee members request. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to go and then take some nice pictures. But it was a big relief to me to see that they have advanced that far in such a short amount of time. Yeah, I think most of the delays, unfortunately, were COVID related. You know, for a couple of months there, nobody was doing anything. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I realize that. And, and then also the state was was yeah. really long coming up with money for right. the same reason no one was working at the state. Right. So, um, so, so those are the updates. Um, I don't know if you want me to go through all the projects. I, I updated the project uh, inventory about a week ago. Yeah, so that. So, okay. well, we need to we need to uh, to have an executive committee meeting as well, right? Yeah, that's that should have started a few minutes ago. Okay. Well, I so, can make a motion to adjourn. I, I could second it. All, all in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Yes. All right. Talk to you very soon. Talk to you later, Tom. All right. Bye bye. Bye, Jeanette. Bye bye. Okay.